My guest today is Leslie Jane Seymour. Many of you may know her from her acclaimed career in magazine publishing, where she established herself as one of the industry's, if not one of our culture's, most respected leaders. Her experience in the media industry began early. Before her leading roles as editor-in-chief, she worked as beauty director of Glamour and senior editor at Vogue. She went on to be editor-in-chief of Marie Claire, Red Book, and YM. Under her leadership, they were all reshaped and transformed into something not only bigger, but greater. Most recently, until February 2016, she served as editor-in-chief of More Magazine, where she notably won hundreds of awards and created history by having First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, guest edit an entire issue. Beyond print, she used information and education she had access to at the magazines to call attention to issues that impact women around the world. Just a few of the programs she became involved in include domestic violence, she spearheaded Time to Talk Day in Congress to raise awareness, One World, One Wish for International Relief Campaign Save the Children, World Food Program, she brought Drew Barrymore to Kenya to shine a spotlight on the issue of rising hunger and the barriers to education for girls. Domestic violence in the Latino community, she took the Marie Claire magazine team to walk alongside with Salma Hayek down the Washington Mall, and she traveled to Japan and Cambodia with First Lady Michelle Obama to cover the launch of Let Girls Learn, Obama's program to help girls around the world get a better education. And that's just a glimmer of her past professional background. As for what she's doing now, we're going to talk to her about that. But she's taken her expertise, knowledge, and experience and established Covey Club, an online offline club for lifelong learners who want to continue connecting, reinventing, and impacting the world. She's a sustainability expert getting her master's at Columbia, continuing to learn yet more herself. And let's hear now more from Leslie. Hi, today I'm talking with Leslie Jane Seymour. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, how are you? Nice Um, to see you. Nice to see you too. I'm sorry, there's a delay. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, For a minute. For many of our listeners, they may know you from your long, successful magazine publishing career, but I'd like to start by hearing more about Cubby Club, which you are the founder of and is an incredible community. So please tell us about Cubby Club. Well, first of all, everybody says, what the heck is Cubby? What does it mean? And Covey is a small group of birds. I wanted to denote something that is small and intimate, which is kind of the opposite of what's going on today. Everything today with women seems to be big and giant. Um, You go to events where you sit football fields away from people that stand on stage and they're about this big. Um, And you may as well be here in your home listening to them through a computer. Um, rather than being there in real life. And I think what we're really craving today is actually getting together in real life or what I really love is exactly what you're doing, Jan, which is I find things like this, Zoom, I find it very, very intimate where you can talk to people one-on-one. And that's what Covey's all about is getting together, having intimate conversations, having those difficult conversations, having the conversations that matter. Um, and so that's what I do. I'm a, a media person, and Covey's about half events, half content. Content is the, co- is the glue that holds this community together. The community is for women 40 plus, though some women, of course, nothing magical about the day you turn 40. It's just kind of, it's women in transition, and in general, transition happens to you when you've lived a little And it could be a health transition, it could be a work transition, it could be having kids, it could be when your kids are um, getting a little bit older and they don't need you so so much. You know that point when your kids, you put the key in the door and they no longer come running downstairs and glom onto you, which is 
a wonderful moment when you can actually take your clothes off without them clinging to you. And, and it's also a horrible moment when you realize that, oh my God, they don't need me like they used to. Who am I? Where am I going? Why am I here? No one needs me. No, it's a, it's a, it's all these different transition moments. And then of course, as your kids get to be really a little bit older, um, when they are, when you're getting towards approaching empty nest, when you are in empty nest, um, and then at the same time, for many of us, we're at the, at the very same time, we're in that sandwich situation where we have our parents that we're taking care of as they get older. Who's talking about this? There's no place to go. And um, that's what the Covey community is doing. And we have a blog. We have a daily blog, which talks about all these situations. We have a monthly digizine. It's digital. It's not print, but it's basically the same thing. I ran more magazine. Print is not viable anymore, so it is a digital space. We have Coffee and Conversation, which are virtual, um, what do you want to call them, panels, much like this, where I take two people and we interview um, virtually. And I'll take two experts. We'll interview like this. We do it for an hour on Wednesday nights. And then I throw open the floor where we can talk about these. People can ask questions live, and then we also publish them. Um, we have a thing called CoveyCast, which is a podcast, which is called Reinvent Yourself with Leslie Jane Seymour, where I interview women who are older, who are reinventing themselves and or creating ways for women to reinvent themselves, um, platforms to reinvent themselves. No one's talking to women who are not 20 years old about how to reinvent themselves. And guess what? The average age of an entrepreneur today is not 20 it is 39, okay? So let's get with program here and let's start talking to the people who are actually doing it. Um, and then we also offer a B2B situation where I've offered up Covey uh, platform to entrepreneurs and solopreneurs who need to put their product out there and get some testing. Um, they can also uh, get feedback for an idea. Where do you go if you... You're making a handbag. You're making, uh, you know, a digital product for this consumer. Where are you going to get some feedback? You can come to Covey. You can put it out there. I can get you some feedback for a very small amount of money. Um, you can put your product out. You can sell it to this community. You can. It's a small way of getting introduced to a small community. We do live events as well. Um, we started doing them in New York, of course, because that's the first community because that's where uh, I've been. Um, we're also doing them in LA, um, and we've done them in Silicon Valley. And then we've got a bunch of Covey connectors that we're bringing in who are going to be around the country, and they're going to bring Covey Club to about eight to 10 communities around the country. And the BHAG, which they call it um, in entrepreneurial speak, the big, hairy, audacious goal is to connect. 230,000 women, which is 1% of the 23 million women at the top of this pyramid of women 40 plus um, who are executives, C-suite, managerial women. Um, I want to connect those women around the country so that whenever you're traveling, wherever you're going, say you're going to Austin, Texas, and you have Monday night free, um, and you can go on the Covey Club site and say, hey, it's Jan, I'm going to be there. Um, I have Monday night free. Anybody want to meet for a glass of wine? And you're going to have wine with some interesting woman who you've never met before. or Maybe you've seen her on the Covey Facebook page. And you're going to connect. And maybe you're going to get a new friend. Or maybe you're going to do business with her. Or maybe you're going to do business with her friend. Or maybe you're going to stay in her house because her kids are gone and she's got an extra bedroom. Crazy idea. <laughs> I think it's a phenomenal idea. and you really captured some, a, a huge issue in our culture right now with an answer. Connected. Yeah, the connection. Our rates of isolation, depression, all of that are skyrocketing despite the increase in technology and the ability to the ability to supposedly connect. But what you're describing is an authentic connection. Well, here's what's going on. We don't have any town squares. We don't go to religious services anymore. We don't have places that we meet. If you are either isolated in your workspace or being pushed out or have been pushed out or pink slipped 
or you are an entrepreneur, or you are a stay at home, you are not connecting. Where are you connecting? You may have, I have 9,000 friends on Facebook. Do I see anybody? I don't. It is a very isolating world that we live in. Mm -hmm. We need to connect in person. We need to connect in a deeper way. And we know that. Um, frankly, the, the horrible things that happened in the last few weeks with Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, we did a piece that was very important, which was called, it was, it was called, um, suicide and depression at mid for midlife women. And it's on our blog. It was a really important piece and it went everywhere because, if you look at the numbers since 1999, the numbers have in suicide have gone up 63% for women alone, mm -hmm. and the rates of depression are up hugely. Mm -hmm. And those are the reasons. And the problem is everybody pretends like everything is fine. No one wants to talk about it. As when you read the stories about Kate Spade, she was told, you know, no one wants to hear about an unhappy designer. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Nobody wants to hear about an unhappy housewife. No one wants to hear about an unhappy editor. No one wants to hear about an unhappy mom. But you know what? Nobody's perfect. Life is not perfect. Life is a journey. It is tough. There are tough moments. We all have tough moments. Let's all get honest with everybody. It's not perfect for anybody. All those things you see on Facebook are not perfect. A lot of it's fiction. We all need to get real with each other. and. We're all here to help each other. We're all here to support each other. And that's really what I want to do. And I want to tell those real stories. And I want to talk about them. We shouldn't have to wait until we see these terrible things happen to people until we say, why didn't somebody know? And why didn't somebody talk? And why didn't somebody share? And we're lucky that we can now take these incidences that are in the news and talk about, talk about these things among ourselves because we can use them to help people who are not famous um, talk about the things that are really, really important. And that's what I'm trying to do. Well, I agree. And I think of every fortunate and unfortunate situation as giving us an opportunity and a gift in some way. And sadly... Yes that was a gift that they've continued to give us through their suicides. Tragic and I mean, just, sad. You know, tragic, tragic, yeah. tragic. And anybody who thinks that it's not hard for everybody and that it's not tough going into empty nest and that, you know, that all those people out there who have, even if you have money and you have, you know, good kids and you have, I mean, it's hard. It's still hard. And the, the really good part about Covey is, is that it really is a giving community and it's a supportive community. And it all starts at the top. And that is my nature. And that is what I want to do. And I get a kick out of supporting women and I get a kick out of connecting women. I've always been a connector. And, um, you know, to be honest, I run four different magazines. The through line, you talk about, you like through lines, um, finding out sort of what through lines in life are. Um, my, my whole thing has always been um, helping women. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And this is a continuation. I ran a team book. I ran Red Book. I ran Mary Claire. And I ran more. And the through line through that is helping women. Yeah. And that is that is what I do. And now, you know, I could be done. I'm certainly, I have the means to be done and I could just go read and sit on a beach somewhere and whatever. A, that's not my personality. B, I'm lucky enough that I'm at the point in my life where I can say, what do I want to do next? What do I, and I, I want to continue helping women and I want to create a business that is self-sustaining that will able other women to help each other and become a business that lets other women help each other and mm -hmm. makes a community that allows women to help each other going forward and sort of takes all those skills that I had and turns them into a community that's active and supportive 
and that uses content. I also want to take all those content producers because there are content producers, people who are writers and photographers and artists and all that who want to make all this stuff. I mean, and then you've got, you know, the publishing model is broken. It's dead, right? Mm -hmm. And they're these wonderful, fabulous artists. They don't want to stop doing this stuff. They want to make this fantastic stuff for us. Mm -hmm. And the, the, you know, the consumers over here and she needs this stuff, right? It's just, she's been taught this is free. Right. The reality is there was a bridge that was between those two things for the last 50 years that allowed it to be free. That bridge is broken. It's been yeah. blown up. That was an advertising bridge. It's blown up. It's gone. The truth is that we, there are, that we've got to find out what that other bridge is. The truth is this consumer still wants that stuff. This producer still wants to make this stuff. The question is, what's the new bridge? And this consumer has money and this maker can still make this stuff. Mm -hmm. How do we bring those two people together? I want to find a business model that is fair to everybody that supports these people and makes this consumer happy. What is she willing to pay to keep these people employed? And that brings these two communities together. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that this consumer only will take it for free. Because when it's for free, you see that out there. The free stuff's out there, and it's crap. It's clickbait. Mm -hmm. It's garbage. I mean, yeah, go out there and get it. There's a lot of garbage out there. You mm -hmm. want, you know, burn fat faster? It's out there. That's what I would have to produce. Every, every four months, I would have to run, it, run an article on burn fat faster, even if, there's no, even if there's no, you know, no information to support that. I would have to run it so that more people would click on it so that my advertisers would come back, right? Right. I don't want to do that. I want to run the story instead on why this woman, we did this fabulous story about this woman who wrote about how her mother clicked the wrong, checked the wrong checkbox when she checked herself into a hospital and accidentally signed herself um, out on Medicare the wrong way and ended up bankrupt. And it's a really important story about... Mm -hmm making sure that your mother doesn't do this when she checks herself into the hospital so she doesn't end up, end up destitute, okay? Right. That's not a clickbait story, but it's a really important story that all of us need to know. Mm -hmm. But it's not for in fat faster. So how do, we, how do we figure this out? That's my goal. I'm hoping that I can find enough readers that will help me do that and understand that this is a worthy goal, will join me in this, and enough producers who will join me as I am a startup and I've got enough people who understand I can't pay them mm -hmm. a livable salary yet, but mm -hmm. I've got enough people who are joining in and I'm paying them token salaries right now and token fees, but they're joining mm -hmm. and um, that's the goal. You know, as you describe that and finding the broken bridge, the bridge for the broken model, I see a big part of that also as a re-education and your hashtag, yeah. which I love yeah. your hashtag. It's so oh, it's such a kooky oh, hashtag. <laughs> but it says everything. You know, it, it does. It's very clear. Yeah. Learn, and, get, connect. It can't exactly, be any clearer. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And as you're talking about the broken model and the bridge, I'm thinking yeah. it requires the getting, obviously, but also I believe a re education. The consumer has a new model to the learn consumer. once it's figured. The consumer needs to be re-educated also, yes. And, um, you know, and there are some people, when I do my research, there are some people who've come into Covey, and when I go back and say, so what do you think? We've been up for, uh, you know, um, three months. And there are some people, a tiny, tiny portion, I would say like 10% maybe, who say, I don't want to pay anything for anything. It's like, okay, fine. That's fine. You know, that's, there's going to be a portion of those people. I get it. Um, there's a lot out there on the web for people who don't want to pay anything. Right. I do right? right. There is a portion of um, people that just want everything for free. So, but I do think there is a portion of people who recognize that you get what you pay for, and if you want a better quality product, and if you want things that are thoughtful, um, you will have to pay something for it. Yeah. So, and I think in many cases we as a culture or a society have created that model of expect for free. A lot of the business building methodology and all in the past 10 years has encouraged it. And it's really to everyone's detriment, in my opinion. 
Well, I'll tell you, it's very funny. I'm getting my um, master's up at Columbia, mm -hmm. and I actually just finished a paper on Sunday where I actually I had to finish a course was for international political economy, and I had to do an assessment of why print journalism was in decline. And I actually traced back why this model is broken. And mm -hmm. what's really interesting is the model goes back. We think that Facebook and Google are such new. We think they're new. We think they're new. their model is new, right? The whole advertising is free model. Um, and the whole idea of where print, where print came from, the idea of journalism being free and being paid for by advertising actually comes from in the old days, back in the 1800s, print was, there were, you could buy print, printed things and it was expensive. It was, it was for elite people mm -hmm. only, right? And it was six right. cents for a newspaper. It was really expensive. You couldn't afford it. There was this one guy who came along and he said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the cost instead of six cents. I'm going to drop it to a penny. It was called penny, penny papers, right? right? And so, and they were going to sell it as mass papers to everybody. And now, but what he did is he then by doing that, it's exactly what Facebook is doing. You're no longer selling the content. You're selling the customer. The customer became the product and mm -hmm. that's the problem. And that's, the root of all the problems we have today and the reason why Facebook is selling you is because you are the product. It started in the 1830s. Interesting. And that is what is so interesting because if you were paying for the actual content, it wouldn't be like that. But it, start, that it started with – and I always thought that Facebook – I thought it was such a different model. It's not. It's actually just a, a like an uber extension of what was going on with free advertising, paying for everything. That's interesting. So, anyway, there's the there's the you know the academic version of what we're talking about, which I love because it also is very instrumental in figuring out what the solution for the broken model is. And the broken model is now returning to paying for content, and you're seeing that with the New York mm -hmm. Times. Their subscriptions mm -hmm. are way way up. You're seeing it with Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Their subscriptions are coming up. People are realizing that slowly, slowly, that you have to pay for things that are better. Yeah. And it's slowly, slowly coming back. So yeah. I'm hoping to be part of that. <laughs> and I actually am doing pretty well. I have a lot of people who are coming in. We have a, a high end. We have a high end um, a part of the club, which is give and get networking for people who are looking for it's totally off the record. You come in and it's you come in with a give, you come in with a get. And it's networking for women who want to really be able to talk in a private way about what their needs are. It could be anything from you need a contract lawyer to you need, you need names of, a, of testing for your kids because you can't talk about it in your community. Mm -hmm. Or you just want to get to know women who are outside of your community for whatever reason. Maybe you're a lawyer and you can't get to know other lawyers or you've got to get out of whatever area you're in or you find it hard to make friends. When you get to be older, it's really hard to make friends, especially yeah. as your kids get to be older and you're no longer on the soccer field. Where yeah. are you going to make those real friends who are interested in you? Yeah. And especially also if you're going to be an entrepreneur, where do you go to make these new connections as you're going into the second half of your life? Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, one of the things that you said had been a thread that I am continuing to see as you talk is the connection. And it, with that top end group, that's absolutely the case. I'm curious when you first knew as like a young girl or a young working woman, or when did you first know that making lives better for women and somehow connecting them with knowledge and other people was part of you? Well, I knew, I never, I would never have been able to tell you this when I was young, but looking back, I can explain it to you. When I was growing up, I was, my parents divorced when I was 10 and I was very isolated. It was very early on. 
and it was the late sixties and um, I would lived in suburban New Jersey and divorce was very uncommon back then. And my mother was not very stable. She was actually kind of cuckoo when they got divorced and the kids around me, their families acted like I had a disease and I was told I was not allowed to play with the other kids on the block. And so I resorted to magazines. And I very specifically remember Seventeen magazine. I would read, I mean, I needed, I needed an outlet. I needed to find, I had no, who could I talk to? No one would talk to me on the block. I was totally isolated. And I found, and it's not only a escape there, but I found knowledge where I could find other people who were talking about situations like mine and I found out I was not alone and that was extremely important to my development was understanding I was not alone no surprise I went into magazines to understand that I was not alone all those magazines I did the whole ecosystem of magazines and women's magazines was teaching us you're not alone what Covey Club is all about is you are not alone. Mm -hmm. And the irony is digital, which is fantastic, is even better than print for telling you you're not alone because I no longer even have to get in my car and go to the supermarket to go buy a magazine. I can just open my phone and find out I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can go to my computer and find out I'm not alone. And that is wonderful. And building a community is better in digital than it ever was in a magazine. So, but it's all the same thread. And that sense of isolation has always been one of my issues. And it really has to do with growing up as a child of divorce in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. What, what is your biggest um, challenge with connecting women now? Um, the biggest challenge is trying to figure out how to monetize it okay. because it has, to, it can't be a charity. Right. Um, it has to be a sustaining business because I want to do this and then I want to be able to make it a legacy that I can pass along to somebody else who can turn it over to the next generation. Mm -hmm. I really would indeed like to make it a set of clubs around the country and around the world that. I mean, really, honestly, I know this sounds completely nuts, but wouldn't it be great if you had, oh my goodness, they've decided to chop down every tree on my block today, <laughs> right now, while we're talking. I hope that's okay. It's whatever, you. whatever we're doing, it's just whatever. Um, but uh, wouldn't it be amazing if wherever you went, if you went to London, Paris, mm -hmm. Rio, St. Petersburg, that you could stop in and see a cubby club there. Like you could, you know, just pop in and see a bunch of women like you and they, they were like you and they, you know, could show you around or, you know, you could talk to them about whatever, or where's the, you know, what are the greatest beauty products to find in San Paolo or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what is, what is the greatest, you know, what is the greatest cafe to go to in, in uh, St. Petersburg or what, you know, I mean, I just love the idea of community and I love the idea of women connecting to women. And I think, you know, women need each other right now. And I think we need each other more than ever right now. And I think we need each other, not just nationally, but internationally. And I think we can help each other. And I think there is a sense in the world that we can help each other and that if we don't stick together together, and I don't mean this just 40 plus. I really do believe this is across generations. And I find an awful lot of women in their 20s and 30s who want to come and be part of Covey Club, which is a complete shock to me. And the reason why they want to come part, be part of this, they tell me, is because they're lost. I mean, the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings are really struggling out there because they don't have any mentors. Things right. have been so stripped down, so different from when I was out there in corporate life. There are no mentors because everything's so stripped down. The mentors have no time. They're, everybody's running at such breakneck speed. I mean, when I was there, I had people teaching me to write. I had people who had time for me. And 
they taught me to write. I mean, God bless them. I learned, I spent five years in Vogue writing school. They mm -hmm. took my copy, they circled the words, they X things out. I went back to my office, I retyped. They went back and they re-edited it again. And, um, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. So I feel really, really, really sad. And um, I think we're going to bring in a bunch of younger women and do some things um, about mentoring. Good. And um, because I just, I just feel like we have to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, you know, a lot of older women now realize that that's one of the things that we need to do also. The generation above me really didn't do much men mentoring for my generation. Right. They kind of pulled the ladder up because they had it really tough, you know, and they figured, you know, they figured it was tough on them. Mm -hmm. They had it tough. So, you know, you'd be tough. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think we feel that way. No. And I think that those women were trying to teach us, but they yeah. did it in a way that may not have really felt like teaching. It felt more to me like isolation and shunning. Um, yes. But I agree. Yeah. Mentoring is such a gift. The model, if uh, the economic model is a challenge, what isn't working? Because you do have one that appears to be very smart with your yes. tiering of pricing. What yes. needs to be added or changed to make it work? Um, I'm trying to, you know, what you do is it's called um, uh, agile innovation is what they call yep. it. It's got a fancy name. Um, where you work with your consumer and you you ask them, what can I do to make it better? What can I, I mean, I'm a natural um, consumer worker. I love working with consumers and asking them all the time, what do you like? What don't you like? Can I, what can I fix? What can I not fix? Um, so that's what you got to do. It's just because nobody's done this. Um, mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's 20 sites like, there are 20 content sites out there for women 40 plus. Most of them are either sites where it's just paid content mm -hmm. or there are sites, you know, there are Facebook pages with people who just come on and talk and there's no monetization at all. Um, you know, there's really no, nobody's created a model. Mm -hmm. Everybody says it can't be done. So I'm really trying to do something that's a hybrid that has never been done before. So I'm making it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is how I all do, in, I'm sorry. I do have, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm making it up. Which is so how I need enough people to join me. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll absolutely get the message out on that because what you have is truly different and valuable. When you were talking about a global presence, I think that's really mm -hmm. important. We are not one society anymore, we are a global culture. No, we're and global. And traveling um, as an older woman is different than traveling as a younger woman. Absolutely. <laughs> and wouldn't it be wonderful to have women um, who are a little older everywhere? Mm -hmm. And we, we know things that are going on. And I don't know. I mean, I just, I just love, I don't know. I love meeting interesting women. And I love women who've lived a little. Mm -hmm. And... I love women who tell it like it is. I think that's what's wonderful about being older is you don't really have time for the bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that's what, you don't, you don't care about what other people think so much anymore, maybe to a fault. You know, if anything, you know, what people can say is when you get a little bit older, maybe you, maybe you should care a little more and be a little more careful, but, eh. you know, it's like time short. <laughs> yeah. You know, I did all that. I spent all that time. Every time I used to walk into the copy room at Vogue and I was so worried if, if everybody liked me, did they like me? You know, so-and-so looked at me wrong and she didn't like me and she was unhappy with me. And, oh, my God, she, you know, she looked my way and she didn't smile. What did I say wrong? And now I'm like, oh, you know, who cares? It's her issue. Uh, you know, I don't have time. If she doesn't like me, so what? You and know? maybe she likes you and has a bad day and doesn't know how to yeah. have a different, you know, I mean, it could be anything. So I agree. Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe her cat threw up on her, on her mm -hmm. outfit this morning. I don't know, <laughs> you know, yeah, whatever. And those things so, are very real too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but to a fault, I think, I think what happens is 
we take it too far now. Whereas before I thought everything was my fault. Now I'm, I think what happens is you get older where you think nothing's your fault and you're probably at fault half the time and you think it's not you. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's such wisdom in that. There's probably at every point a uh, equal measure of blame or accountability, right? Right. Um, right. So at, now that you're an entrepreneur, you've written, and I'm not even going to repeat what you've written because people should just read your articles. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, you're a great writer, and I know that's a big part of who you are as well as a writer. But as in a life as an entrepreneur, what have you found both the most challenging and rewarding? The hard part really was the isolation. That was really hard mm-hmm. because that was one of the reasons why I didn't become a full-time writer. I could have become a full-time writer. I could have written books. Um, and that would have been a very natural thing to do, but I don't like the isolation. And I was shocked at how isolating becoming a uh, entrepreneur was. I did not realize how isolating that is. Now that Covey club is launched, it's not as isolating and the entrepreneur world is fabulous and the most exciting, interesting people I've ever met in my entire existence are all entrepreneurs. And once a month, I have a gathering here at my house, which is not unlike Leslie's List. It probably was the precursor to Leslie's List. I just invite all the local entrepreneurs I can find. Um, and any women who are listening who are in Westchester who are entrepreneurs, call me. We, it's called Red, Red Cup Women. And um, we meet once a month. And you come. And you bring breakfast or lunch for six people and we all meet at my house and we talk about our issues and we talk about different things that we're trying to do and we look at each other's stuff and help each other through different things. And um, it's a great group of women and um, we've each seen each other progress and helped each other with, you know, MailChimp and helped each other with, you know, how do I how do I find someone to help me with this or that? And um, it's been really wonderful. But it is very isolating. No one explains that to you. And also, after being a corporate cog, what no one explains to you also, it's a very different start. It is a very different thing to go from. Corporations have momentum, mm-hmm. and I've always been at you know. For the last 20 years, I've been at the top of corporations. And no matter what job you have at the top, you kind of just parachute in and you start rolling, right? Mm -hmm. And on Friday, when you walk out, the corporation keeps going. And if you don't come in on Monday or you're on a plane, the river keeps going. And then you just drop your boat in again on Monday and it starts floating. As an entrepreneur, you sit down at your dining room table, which you see right here, and nothing happens. And it's dead for two years. And until you launch, there is no momentum. And every single morning for two years, you sit there and you say, nothing's happening today. And if I don't push this rock up a hill every single solitary day, if I just close the computer and go to the beach, there is nothing. It is the weirdest existential thing that I'd ever dealt with. And I knew that if I got to the point of launch where there was deadlines to meet, it would feel very familiar once I had deadlines and things were moving and it would be okay. But I mean, imagine that for 40 years, I've had deadlines to me. I've always been a reporter. I've always been a writer. I've always been an editor. I've always had a magazine every month. I've had something very tangible. And now suddenly nothing. Right. So very, 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 very weird, 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 weird. <laughs> and literally, there were days where I would sit here and think, no one cares. Like, if I don't do this, no one cares. No one cares. For two years, no one cares. I could just disappear yes. and no one cares yeah. and two years every single day and I was working 24 7 and no one knew and no one cared who cared mm-hmm. so it was the weirdest thing it's very very hard if you're used to producing every day if you're used to meeting with people every day making that happen 
from a standstill. And it's not just like, what's weird is it's not starting, it's not starting the car from, from cold once. It's starting the car from cold every single day for two or three years, every yeah. single morning. You got to start the car like, and that, that engine you hear out there, like you got to like start it. Like, and like and every single day you're pulling that thing and you're going, why? What if yeah. this goes nowhere? Who cares? Maybe no one will care. Maybe it'll fail. It'll probably fail. Most things fail. One out of 10 fail. Why am I doing this? You know, and then you're pulling the cord and you're going, your husband's going, why are you doing this? And your yeah. kids are going, why are you doing this? You know, it's like, it's, it's a very weird, it's a very weird um, kind of like being out in the middle of water with no wind. You're just in the middle of still trying to make something happen. And um, it's strange. Yeah. So it's weird. But once you get it going, and now I have like a heartbeat, I have people, oh. I have things happening, and I have people joining me. Now they, you know, before I had to explain to people what this is, and they were like, I kind of get it, I don't get it. Now what's great is people are sending me stuff. People look at it, and people are from all over the world. People are writing articles and they're saying, sending me things. Can I write for you? And I'm, they're sending me clips. And like, I feel like my old self again. It's like, yeah. oh, like, that's really cool. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm a startup. I don't have any money, but I'd love to look at your piece and I could give you a tiny token. Mm -hmm. And poets are sending me stuff. People are responding a lot to the very serious pieces we're doing. I had this guy who just sent me a thing and he said, I, I, you know, I just, my mother's passed away and it was this horrible, horrible time between, you know, Wanting to, to wanting her to live, but also seeing how horrible it was for her, and I want to write about this terrible dichotomy between, you know, this terrible situation of wanting her to pass and at the same time not wanting her to pass, and and I, you know, and I'm like, wow, I want to look at your clips. Like, and he's a poet, and it's like, yeah, let me see your clips because we're all going through that. That's a mm -hmm. this is a horrible, horrible time and a horrible thing, and. If you could explain that, that's that's the stuff I want to write about. You know, I want I want somebody who can can do that. So I'm thrilled when people are finding me. You know, so maybe I can be like Paris Review slash Glamour Magazine. Absolutely, <laughs> I want to do makeup tips too. <laughs> well, and that's one of the things that I think you bring together in a really um, wonderful way is all of the stages and areas right. of life from investment and angel right. investors to makeup and clothes right. and diet. How to get on a board. Yeah, to get on exactly. Board. Yep. All yeah. the stuff you want to know, like all the stuff. Um, and I was just talking to some young women today, and we're going to try to figure out what that story is about, you know, all these women who are, you know, after they have their, um, their first kids and how they're trying to integrate themselves back into work and all the resistance they're meeting no matter all this stuff that the corporations tell them all that, you know, they're not, they're not getting the help that they need. Yeah. You know, they're, they've got all these policies and all this stuff and yet they're coming to these women for coaching and, the, and they're just saying, you know, I'm not getting the help I need. What am I going to do here? It's so, such a, yeah. It's tough. It's really tough. It's very tough. And providing solutions and answers is a way through. It did, when you were talking about the various aspects of both your um, stages of life through the decision um, of going forward with Covey Club and then talking in general, it strikes me that, yes, you could have very easily, if you were another person, chosen to be at the beach, be in your garden, do those sorts of things when you left um, publishing. But you didn't, and you got through those existential days by that inner drive. How do how do you, in a real tactical way, because I think, well, I'll speak for myself. I know from working for myself and being an entrepreneur, there are many days when even though anybody around me would think that, you know, everything's great, I wake up and think, who cares? I think that's part of the right. life. So how do you right. pull yourself past those little voices to action? I am just in happy in action. 
I am, I know this, it's really interesting. My daughter's just like me. And it's funny because I don't understand the people who, when they see a problem, they don't, they, they procrastinate or they walk away or they um, avoid because that to me is the worst thing you can do because then you stew or you feel terrible or whatever. When I have anxiety, I do. Mm -hmm. I deal with anxiety by doing. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, it seems to be a very acceptable way of dealing with anxiety by society's standards, which is why I've done very well. It kind of fits with society's okay Mm -hmm. way to deal with anxiety. (laughs) It's productive. Productive is okay. Um, So I produce. That's what I do. And um, so whenever I feel the anxiety, I get up at five and I start doing. And I don't know any other way to deal. I would be depressed. Like, it's really funny because my husband is retired and he looks at me and he thinks I'm crazy. Like at one point we had this discussion and um, he said, you know, because I'm also finishing my master's up at Columbia in sustainability. So I'm trying them two courses away from getting the master's. Oh, Oh my God. Oh. Let's celebrate when you get that done. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Oh, my God. And um, he said to me at one point, he said, you know, he said, my idea of the ideal day is to wake up in the morning with nothing to do. And I said, that's my idea of death. And it's so interesting because I can't imagine anything more horrifying than nothing to do. If I had a day with nothing to do, I would load it up with take a jewelry course. Like I said to my daughter, as soon as I'm done with the master's at Columbia, I I have on my radar at the 92nd Street Y in New York, I saw that they give a a jewelry casting course. Not like not like bend the wires to make No, I know what you're saying. The lost wax. There's yes, there's like you can do like um, you know, real real jewels and you can do I'm like I'm there. I'm going. That's like, that's on my list already. I'm Mm -hmm. like, it's so it's, that's just who I am. What can I do? That's it. You know what? You just have to give in to who you are and know who you are and what makes you happy. And you know, it's not my husband that would make him miserable. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So it's exactly what you said, honoring who you are and how you're made up and that gets you through. And I do think, I mean, in terms of mentoring, this is a message that I think is important for younger women. I think it's when we go against what our real nature is and who we are, that we create those problems. I think you have to know who you are Mm -hmm. and you have to accept who you are and not try to be someone else. Right. And you have to be comfortable with who you are. And you have to be comfortable with the fact that even if a neurosis drives who you are, as long as the neurosis is not making you unhappy, as long as it's not hurting anybody else, if you're happy with it, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if it's not a destructive neurosis, I mean, we're all driven by something. And, you know, and however the leaf is, however the twig is bent. Right. Um we're all driven by something and um, is it a okay process or is it not? And I don't, you know, I, and I tend to, the reason why Covey club, the, um, the tagline is for lifelong learners who mm-hmm. want to connect. Um, it, and it, I, I, I realized that the through line for more magazine when I was there was all about learning. And that's mm-hmm. been, my whole thing. I am always happy when I'm learning. Mm-hmm. No matter, and my jobs, I always left a job when I stopped learning. And the reason why I went back to school was at about year five at Moore when it became very clear that publishing was just in horrible trouble. People across town, Time Inc. was laying off 500 people at a time every year. Meredith was constantly churning and laying people off. I mean, I'd run four magazines. I didn't want to run another magazine. It was very clear that this was just not a healthy business. Mm -hmm. And I really had to think about what I wanted to do next. That's when I decided to go back to school. And 
I really did it partially because I said, okay, what do I want to do next that's not publishing, which is not so healthy? And I decided to, to go back and learn something that I started doing in my past. When I was in my 20s, I went to Duke University to study. I wanted to be a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. And I went to Duke specifically because they had Beaufort, which was I wanted to be a marine biologist and you could go to the Beaufort labs. I was not prepared in the science area at that point um, enough. I had gone to a girls' school and they did not prepare me enough in science so that when I hit all these guys who were in my um, lab, not labs, labs I did great, when we were in the big lectures with a thousand mm -hmm. people and I was put on a curve test, my curve tests were like, yeah. Yeah. and then you put me in the English courses and suddenly my grades are like this, right? Mm -hmm. So you're in your 20s. Gee, where do you think the money is when you're in your 20s? Up here or here? Right. <laughs> so I turned over and became an English major in my junior year, right? I abandoned all that. I was able to go back at night school to Columbia, and I thought I, I would have um, more time to finish my degree, and I thought what I would do is when they pulled the plug on more, I thought I would go to, into the beauty companies in sustainability. I thought I would go over into corporate and beauty. I'd been a beauty editor at Glamour. Mm -hmm. And then when they pulled the plug on more and my readers came to me and said, do something else for us, and then I started Cubby Club, and then I left corporate, I don't think I ever want to go back to corporate again. I, just, yeah. I don't want to put the spanks on. I don't want to put the high heels on. I don't want to go into the city in the blinding snow on the train yeah. at 530 in the morning anymore. I don't want yeah. to do it. Go in in the so, dark and come out at the dark. Yeah. I don't want to. I'd rather be an entrepreneur. I'm so much happier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could you know? keep talking about your next chapter of reinvention as a sustainability expert, but we'll save that for another show. That'll be the third one. Exactly. What would you like to share that I haven't asked you? Hmm. I think you've asked pretty much everything. Um, I just think that the really important thing for everybody to realize is it's never too late. And I see a lot of people trying to figure it out and trying to um, – they feel, they feel like, you know, they're searching and they feel bad that they're searching and they feel like they haven't come up with what the thing is. And I think in some cases, there is no one thing. Mm -hmm. I think you need to grab a thing. I think there, you know, it's kind of the way I felt a little bit about, you know, relationships and marriage. I feel like there's a range. Like you could probably have a relationship in marriage with 20 people and it's on a continuum and you're going to have poor to fabulous and somewhere in between, right? And, you know, there are many different relationships. I don't necessarily feel like there's only like it's Prince Charming. There's only one guy out there for you. There's probably a range of people and it depends on who you meet and when and where and what you decide to do. I feel that kind of with reinventions, probably a range of things. Mm -hmm. But I, I think in your 40 plus, don't sit there and, and, and you know, woo, ruminate and worry. Find something. Start. Don't, don't wait for the perfect thing. You know, if something presents itself, grab it. And one of the things I hear an awful lot talking to people about reinvention, a very common phrase is you have to be ready to recognize a reinvention opportunity when it throws itself in front of you. Mm. People okay. say this all the time. I was looking for, I was going to go into sustainability. I was getting my degree at Columbia for sustainability. They pulled the plug on more. My readers came to me. That opened another door. Mm -hmm. I could have ignored that door. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I don't know if this is going to work. It looks like it's going to work. I don't know. I'm finishing both. It's driving me crazy to finish both. Um, I don't know, but I'm jumping on it. Mm -hmm. I think a really, really common thing is people are looking for, they, they're blind. They're blind. They're not keeping their eyes open to the opportunities that are throwing themselves in front of them and try it. You know, all those times where you say, you know, why didn't somebody make a pink pen instead? 
why didn't somebody make, you know, a, you know, a pen with a double eraser on it? Instead of saying, why didn't somebody do it? Do it. Just freaking get on the computer and do it. And the difference between you and the person who did it is that they got on the computer that night and they did it. Try it. And honestly, you've just got to jump in and try it. I didn't know what I was doing. I've been a corporate cog my entire life. I have no idea what I'm doing. People say to me, where, you know, where are you getting this plan from? How do you know, why are you doing coffee and conversation? Why are you doing blah, 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 blah? Why are you, where are you make that? I'm like, turn around and look at my back pocket. That's where it's coming from. It's all being made up. Um, I am, I have no idea. I am making it up. I'm listening, trying to listen to the people who are coming to me. I'm trying to make it up with my consumer. Um, I'm making it up. I'm throwing things against the wall. You know, that's what you do. Who knows? But I think really, really important is if you see an opportunity, jump at it and don't wait for only one opportunity. Maybe you'll have two. Mm -hmm. Jump mm -hmm. in. Try it. Do it. Don't keep waiting. And especially if you're older, you can't keep waiting. And you might have to make a small investment. You can make a small investment. And the other thing, too, is um, if you're around the age of 40, even if you think that everything is fabulous at your corporate job, start stashing away at least a year's worth of money. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. Our world is so tumultuous right now. Work is very tumultuous, especially for women. They may love you today, but that doesn't mean they're going to love you tomorrow. Yeah. You need at least a year's worth of salary stashed away somewhere. For a reinvention, you may need it in your 50s. You may need it in your 60s. Women tend to be pushed out about 10 years earlier than men do. Men are kind of getting pushed out right before retirement, like in their early 60s, mm -hmm. really kind of meanly. Women, it seems to me, I don't have any numbers yet, but they kind of get pushed out in their 50s. They've kind of got another 10 years left, and they get pushed out before that. Mm -hmm. um, you may need to be an entrepreneur. Have that money in your pocket. Put it away now. If you don't need it, hey, buy yourself a car, you know? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, but just put it away so you have it. Um, I know too many women who say to me, oh, you know, I've been here for 22 years. They love me. It has nothing to do with you. They can be bought tomorrow and moved to Canada. Right. They can, you know, whatever you're doing. And I see that. I see it a yeah. lot. You know, they yeah, get merged all of a sudden. You had no idea this was going on upstairs. And you walk in tomorrow and suddenly they're downsized. You know, it's nothing to do with you. Yeah, exactly. And um, you can be taken by surprise. The, the cycle of work has changed. Um, and let's be really honest that, you know, experience counts for nothing right now. And um, you can find yourself in a tough situation really fast. So have, have a backup plan. Have an idea. If something presents itself, jump on it. Um, and you can do things on the weekend. You can, you can try things on the weekend. You can have a lot of people, you know, the kids talk about a side hustle. You can have that going. Um, try things on a weekend. Try things on a vacation. But I suggest always to have plan B, at least in this world we live in. That's excellent That's my best input. advice. Yeah, excellent. Before we close, I want to ask you one last question. Um, with all your accomplishments and all of your recognition, at the end of our days, how would you like to be known? Well, number one as JJ and Lake's mom. <laughs> that I was Perfect. a good mom. Isn't that yeah. terrible? I was a good mom. That's the most important thing that matters to me and that I helped other women. That's really important. And I made a difference. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll have all the uh, links on the show notes. And I encourage everyone to check out coveyclub.com for all the information. There's different levels you can participate with. But it's just a phenomenal concept and community. And thank you for being you and for what you do. Great. Thank you, Jan, and thanks so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Oh, this is great. It's a pleasure. Take care. 
you too.